Hello Visual Effects people, I'm AK and this is Fluid Ninja Live 1.8 and a half. In this edition we are focusing on complex environments and to meet the Unreal 5 standards. New output material slots has been added, so a single simulation could drive surfaces, particles and volumes. We have also added a new utility called the Floor Snapper, which is aligning rotation and position in the world, so you could place volumes and particles and they are going to follow the landscape, the ground. And we have two new demonstration levels showcasing all these features. Besides these, all levels, materials and particle systems have been updated to meet the new Unreal standard. And we have two levels completely resurrected from the grave, which is our favorite vortex and the double simulation level. The new content is located in the use cases subfolder, the levels, and it is use case number 18A, snow, and B, sand. Besides these two levels, we have the resurrected levels and have a look at the last part of the level names. There is this tag live18. In case you see this, that level has been updated as well. So let us quickly rush through the new levels and see what we have. So, that is a quick content review, but then let us return to this introductory level to discuss a few more things. First, Ninja version numbering. This and this digit here, 1.8, is the main version. The third digit is indicating the Unreal Engine version, in this case for Unreal Engine 5, and the fourth digit is the subversion, in this case 0.5. You could check your Ninja version number by going Edit, the Project Settings, the Description, and here you see a project version. Very important. Ninja exists in separate branches, currently three branches. We have one for Unreal Engine 4. In this case, the version number looks like this. For Unreal Engine 5, looks like this. And for Unreal Engine 5.1, it looks like this. These are separate branches and these are not compatible. So you cannot load a Ninja version made for Unreal Engine 5 under Unreal Engine 5.1. So much about version numbers. Next, learning resources. As always, I'm pointing you to the project homepage where you could see these yellow links and in case you click on any of these YouTube playlists, it is teleporting you to uh, this YouTube profile where you have like uh, lists with tutorial content. Probably the most important is the all-in-one tutorial. This video is quite long, two hours, but it's introducing you to all the basic concepts and the good news is we have uh, a separate dedicated level which is matching the tutorial video. So this uh, level is basically uh, 
in sync with the tutorial video. In the tutorial video we are going through this level stage by stage explaining all the basic concepts. In case you would like to work with Ninja it is really highly advised to start with this level and the belonging all in one tutorial video. And of course the manual. Uh, the most important chapters marked with yellow color. And now let us move on to these new levels and check new content. We are in a complex game-like environment, but before talking about the level-specific features, let me talk about something more general. Unreal 5 comes with, with an advanced atmospheric light and fog system and ninja materials, particle systems and level components have been modified to meet these Unreal 5 standards, which means we could adjust the level lightning and all systems including particles and volumes and surfaces are adapting to these changes. And this is true for all levels. Now, talking about the level specific features, we have two setups on level and starting with setup 2, we are employing two ninja actors. The first is running a small scale, 5 or 10 meters fluid simulation that is managing fluid interactions around the character. And the second one is a large scale actor switched to simple painter mode. And simple painter mode is very advantageous because it is not running a full-blown fluid simulation, instead it's just registering uh, object position, so we could draw trajectories and tracks and footsteps and all this in a large area. Um, that is advantageous. The problem is that we don't have fluid simulation on the landscape surface. But uh, please have a look at this uh, cliff stage. We could still enjoy the advantages of running a small-scale local fluid simulation around the player character. So it's like a trade-off situation and you could decide which setup to use. One more thing, a recommendation. In the content browser I'm going to this uh, newly uh, displayed level, which is number 15C, the ultimate introduction to Simple Painter. Here you could see the row paint buffer, and as you move on, you reach um, this borderline where the simple paint buffer is um, applied on a surface, and you could see how it becomes a landscape material. And having a look at the starting zone, we have references to the component and actor details, parameter names, and most importantly, video references, tutorial video references. So this is the ultimate guide to the simple painter in case you would like to learn how it works, this level 15C is the place to start. Returning to the snowy use case level, uh, let us examine setup 1, which is running a single fluid simulation. I am selecting Ninja Live Actor, and at the Actor Details panel, Live Component, the Live Generic and I would like to point you to the output materials. We have three of them. Primary, secondary and the new feature is having a third output material. And why is it needed? Well, the thing is that a single actor is managing landscape surface and particles and volumes together and we have to, we would like to directly access all these entities and provide them with the simulation buffers. Previously, and I'm selecting the component again, we have to use, we had to use a trick which was uh, switching on this uh, drawing simulation buffers internal render targets to an external render target defining what kind of buffer we would like to write out and then selecting a render target and actually writing it on disk and then as a second step selecting a volume and making the volume read that render target. This is a manual process, it's tedious and it's not very efficient because it is using an extra intermediate render target. So the point 
of having this much output materials, namely 1, 2 and 3, is to manage this complexity by direct drive. So we don't have to write extra render targets on disk and we could uh, automatically, as opposed to manual, automatically access all these systems simply by using tags. In case you are interested about direct drive and using tags, you could look up the manual chapter 29.1 and in the all-in-one tutorial video there is a dedicated session for this. The next feature to talk about is the floor snapper. It is a separate utility placed on level and it is aligning objects with the ground. Right now this grey debug plane is representing the simulation area and as you could see I could mount on objects or jump in the air, keep running and jumping and the thing is still aligning with the floor. Now hiding it again I would like to visit um, this stage which is designed to demonstrate how floor snapper um, is used and how levels could be prepared for this usage. So as you could see um, we have this cliff here and this rim and the whole thing looks quite noisy and still um, the volume is seemingly smoothly aligning with the floor. Now let us have a look at this stage. It is instructing us to unhide certain um, hidden objects. So I'm going to the outliner, visiting stage 6, the pit, and here is this group of hidden colliders and I'm unhiding the invisible floor objects. Now what do we have here? Well, these large boxes are meant to mask the ground noise. So these are hidden and when we are here the character is essentially moving on the surface and it is um, generating a, a smooth surface to walk on. So we are ignoring all these rocks with the floor snapper. I'm hiding back the objects and so how do we, how do we uh, manage this uh, ignoring objects, including objects. I'm selecting the, the floor snapper, going to the details panel and here we have the parameters. Response time, the actor that we would like to track, in this case the pawn itself. So we would like to follow the pawn and measure the ground beneath the pawn and figure out the ground normal and the ground surface position and align objects with that. And for that we have to define uh, which actor to track, which is the pawn. And here the third option is the list of actors to be aligned with the floor. As you could see the volumes are the ones that we are aligning. And we could define what to do when the character is jumping. Usually we are switching off the simulation. So uh, we don't have water or sand or snow interaction while we are flying above the snow. And um, this option is the most important. This is um, an input field where we could provide a tag. It reads like ignored by floor snapper. This is a user defined tag. And if I'm visiting this stage called the pit and selecting a random rock which makes the whole surface very noisy and typing in tag, I could see that uh, this rock is marked with the ignored by floor snapper tag which means all these objects are going to be ignored um, by the floor snapper uh, while in the meanwhile uh, the, our character is colliding with them properly so we are like uh, we could mount on these objects we could climb on top of these objects it is just the floor snapper that ignores them uh, basically it's the position and surface normal we are looking for and we are tracking, uh, normally we are tracking the landscape and in this case we are tracking those invisible uh, colliders and ignoring these rocks. So This is a way to prepare a level and to provide uh, the floor snapper with a smooth surface. 
And apart from this surface smoothness, I also would like to point you to this... Um, okay, let us visit this specific stage called the hump. As you could see, um, this is quite a, a steep slope. And while I'm moving uh, on this slope, the simulation area is being rotated to match the slope angle. I'm also visiting the far back stage here because we have uh, spots which are not snow covered and it's very uh, nice to visualize how the, the volume and the particles are aligned with this uh, quite steep slope. And so the main point is that in this case the trick is working nicely because the simulation area and the volume that we are rotating is quite small. Now, what happens if I would like to do the same trick with a large simulation area? Let me visit the hump stage with setup 1. And we are going to see horrible things. As you could see, this large volume, which is at least 20 meters, is doing horrible things while uh, the floor snapper is aligning it <laughs> with the slope. So there is, we have two ways to go. We could keep the simulation area small and so we could have a noisy level because there is no obvious glitches for a small simulation area or on the rest of the level you will not notice that the large simulation area is glitching because uh, the level is built with care and the surface is kept smooth in case on places like this where the surface is not smooth enough I was using these invisible colliders so, again, the two choices are using a small simulation area and align that with a noisy floor, or using a large scale area and providing it with a smooth floor. And finally, let us visit uh, the insides of the floor snapper. So, I'm going to edit uh, the blueprint. Here we are. First, in the header, we have a proper description of what floor snapper is and what the certain parameters are. But the most important part is the normal finding methods. Because right now we are using an exclusive method. We have to pick objects one by one, take them one by one and tell the floor snapper to ignore these. Very tedious job. And if I call this an exclusive method, there is an inclusive method too. For this, I have to go to Edit per Project Settings, find the Trace Channels section, and here create a new trace channel. Then I'm coming back to the Floor Snapper and tell the Floor Snapper to use this newly created trace channel. And if I set the default response of the trace channel to ignore, that means that uh, all objects will be ignored. And then I select the landscape. And in the collision part of the landscape, I could set it to block that specific line trace. I would call this an inclusive method, which means I don't have to add objects one by one because all objects are excluded by default and it is the landscape I have to include. And we have two other methods, so it's like A, B and C, and all the methods are described here in this text box, and it is up to you to implement these methods. The only reason why I was not implementing the inclusive line tracing based method is that uh, for that I, I have to add another trace channel for the project, and I did not want it to uh, contaminate the ninja project by adding yet another trace channel. So, the current exclusive tag based method is to demonstrate how Flow Snapper works. And if you're looking for a quick professional method, you're adding your own line trace and implement the inclusive method. So much about the Flow Snapper. And now, let us visit our twin use case level sand. 
It is almost similar to the snowy setup, except it is fine-tuned to look like sand. And instead of avalanche, we have these, we have these sand flow sites. And the feature I would like to talk about is using particles as input for the fluid simulation. Here, I'm selecting this sand flow Niagara system, opening up in Niagara Editor, and we have two emitters. This one is called hidden particles, so I unhide them to see what they do. And the second one is called capture. And as you could see, we have this particle system periodically emitting waves of balls rolling down the hill and the second emitter is capturing particle position and writing it to a render target. Um, let me check a few details. In the second emitter, here, the write grid to render target is using a user parameter and at the actor details panel I could spot that we are using this single render target. Now, on the ninja side, live component, the live generic, the same render target is defined as input for the fluid simulation. So we are connecting these two systems and this technology, you could remember, is use case 12. So in case you are interested how we are using particles to drive the fluid simulation, use case 12 and all the tutorial videos are going to explain. Uh, so let me just run around a bit and enjoy this level. An important feature is that we could have any number of particle systems on the level. And as you could see, wherever Ninja goes, the particle system is being uh, uh, resurrected or <laughs> switched to awake state and then hey where is the harvester ah here we go uh, let me take it for a walk so um, we are visiting different places on the level and the particle systems are being activated and starting to write that render target in word space and so ninja is picking up on that and we could populate a level let me adjust the lights a bit. Yep, red sunset. Oh, let's make it a night scene. That's how it goes. Now, let me um, let me remind you that we have an important limitation on using particle systems. At least uh, we have to make a workaround to make it even more complex. So, here's one particle system, and as we have determined, it is writing this single render target. And Ninja is reading it. Now, if I select uh, another particle system, I could see that it is writing the same render target. So, if these two particle systems are trying to write the same render target, we have a conflict. And it is not a coincidence that these are so far away from each other. Because while I'm visiting this location, this particle system is active and writing the render target. And after a while, it is being switched off, shut down. And as I'm approaching, another particle system is being resurrected and writing the same render target. And why are we doing this? Because Ninja uh, is capable to read only one render target as an input. But let me suggest a workaround. In case you would like to create an extremely complex level where these particle systems are overlapping, of course you make them write separate render targets and then create a composite or material that is combining these render targets. And see, Ninja could use a material as input. And when you are using a material in, as an input, that material could compose all the particle systems and the render targets. So we could have a very complex scene. And that is my suggestion in case you would like to have a workaround. And finally, let us visit Setup 2, a simple painter, and see how it behaves on this level.
just to recall we are not using a large scale fluid simulation here only drawing trajectories trails tracks and so the local interaction with the sand particles and the volume is managed by a small scale fluid simulation but again local interactions are fine and sand tracks look nice on the large scale so that's the trade-off situation compared to running a large scale fluid simulation that's the deal and so much about the sandy level time to leave this and now we are moving on to use case level 4a this level has been dead for a long time, but it is utilizing such a neat idea that we had to resurrect it. It is using two fluid simulations, one attached to the pound and another one just dumped on the level because it is not moving. And we are combining these two fluid simulations. The one that is attached to the pound is obviously managing the interactions around the pound and in the neighborhood, so objects uh, and and bones and physic bodies are behaving nicely and the second simulation um, is generating a tile pattern so instead of using a simple bitmap and repeating that over the ocean surface we are running a separate simulation now uh, let me demonstrate how does this level look like without the tile pattern first I am uh, hiding the fog because it is going to uh, disturb us. Then, by selecting Ninja, I'm defining another U output material. Right now, currently, we are using this tile simulated. And I'm switching the output material to this guy called single layer no tile. So, that's how the level looks like with just a single fluid simulation running managing these local interactions as you could see this fluid simulation is uh, detecting all the moving objects and generating ripples so it's used like a ripple solver and this time we are ignoring this large baby now uh, having a look at another output material which is uh, the traditional ninja approach which is number one it is tile static texture well it looks quite familiar in it uh, we are using uh, two textures two bitmaps and we are panning these bitmaps over the surface to make it less boring and well yeah it works but to be honest using a second simulation is much more appealing now let me explain technically how it is done uh, first switching back to the proper output material which is number two and then visiting this guy called simulation number two so simulation number two is forced to write the velocity and the density render buffer to an external render target and here comes the trick the output material in simulation 1 which is number 2 which is tile simulated and I'm shrinking the material instance panel on screen I hope you guys see it closing all the parameter windows except the tile map section and here we go we are reading this render target by the output material so the output material is automatically receiving the render buffers from simulation 1 so we don't have to take care of that and we are uh, manually configuring the material to using this render target as a tile map so we are reading in and the second simulation is writing it and so this way since uh, simulation 2 is generating a, a, a tile pattern this way uh, we could populate the whole ocean surface using this 
The IDA is simple and the implementation is a bit tricky. And finally, let me make it a night time and visit a special location where I have placed an Omnilight, a point light source under the water because it looks nice. The foam in the light. And so we are about to leave this level and moving to a quite similar technology, a level employing quite similar technology, which is a use case 4B. Here is the original. We have called it use case 6. And now, as you could read, the parts of use case 6 have been distributed on other levels. We have rivers, we have large water surfaces, and finally the vortex is implemented. So let us visit use case 4B with the vortex. And I am telling you that we are using exactly the same technology. A ninja actor managing local interactions, a second fluid simulation, that is, as you could see, generating a vortex-like pattern. And in this case, we are not using it as a tile pattern mapping over the entire uh, ocean surface, but we are using it as a clamped, as a non-tiling pattern. Oh, let me adjust the lights a bit. So, uh, the vortex pattern is a non-tiling pattern and we have defined its position in word space to fill exactly this space where this uh, where this cone-like geometry is on the level because if I switch on the, the, the wireframe view you could see that we have placed a special object here so it's like we have an entire ocean surface uh, and it's completely planar and we have this uh, cone-like shape inserted in the middle of the ocean surface and the output material is configured to place the second simulation data where this cone shape is. That's how it works. The same trick as on the other level except it is non-tiling. And I'm happy that we get back. <laughs> and we finally uh, have this vortex again because it was such a nice uh, nice large scale effect. I did like it big time and it was a pain to lose it. Anyway, so I advise you to read the level placed texts and uh, try to examine how it is done. The main things are already told and we are leaving this level. And so many other levels have been adjusted. As an example let me jump into small water buddies, use case number 7. This time, a pool is using uh, the single layer, layer water shader, and we, has, we have also implemented the, the recently added uh, caustics feature. We could go underwater, and the whole level is reconfigured to look nice under Unreal 5. Have a look at this cattle with its proper uh, caustics and uh, and uh, single layer water material. We could jump in, do interaction, and the waterfalls have been reconfigured as well. Let me push this guy a little bit and zoom out. Again, this one is using single layer water as well, just like these guys here. So, level 7 is reconfigured to Unreal 5 technology. And the same could be said about many other levels, and I'm not going to visit them one by one. Just to give you an example, visiting uh, number 11, we have an extra stage. And on this stage, we are demonstrating what happens if we are using a two-dimensional uh, ray marge density buffer on particles. So we have shading on the particles as if they are uh, casting shadow on each other. And this stage is just demonstrating this trick. So anyways, these new stages are always um, somehow um, tagged or uh, have a notice that they are added to a level. And 
finally, well, there's so many things to talk about, like uh, to make Ninja Unreal 5 uh, compatible, uh, it was an, uh, a really huge, enormous task. And uh, it, we have been modifying so many things. Again, just an example. I'm visiting Ninja Live component, and here's this part, which is injecting two console commands into the system. And it is to counter a bug present in Unreal 5 related to a, a temporal super resolution, TSR anti-aliasing. And TSR was causing horrible glitches in Unreal 5 and seriously all the, the, the fluid simulation surfaces with, with detail maps looked awful and it took some time to figure out how to use these commands to counter the effects of this glitchy uh, anti-aliasing. And I advise you to use the search panel and if you search uh, the version number of the Ninja you get a list of what have been updated. Like we are spotting a modification in the memory pool manager or uh, we are uh, spotting this change regarding uh, the third output material. So basically you could track down all the changes by simply uh, typing in the version number in any of these blueprints or simply use the tools find in blueprints and this way you could localize the changes. One more example, if I visit the output materials per base, the word space material has been a mess and using this new uh, collapse node and named reroute features we, we have been tidying it up and it looks more clean now so uh, probably you could understand these functional blocks and modify in case you would like to. Again, just an example. So many things have been done. And hope you're going to have a nice time using this new release. 1.8 and a half. And briefly, the next release is going to be 1.9. And we are already working on distance fields. So uh, this is going to be the next hit probably handling infinite amount of objects using the distance field as a collision mask influencing simulation density and is going to be released in the next few months so uh, that's it and have a nice time doing VFX see you